Andrea Wilson Woods has a story we can all respect, honor, cherish, and celebrate. She's a healthcare advocate who lost her sister Adrienne to liver cancer, and she's dedicated her life to preserving her sister's memory in so many different ways. She's the founder of Blue Fairy, whose mission is to prevent, treat, and cure primary liver cancer. And she's also the CEO and co-founder of Cancer University, where she synergizes her talents for advocacy, teaching, and writing. She joined me this week to discuss her sister's story, her journey, the battle to end cancer, her love of education, and so much more. I'm Kevin McShann. Let's have this conversation. Ready, I'll welcome you to the program, and we're excited to learn all about your uh, efforts to fight liver cancer and uh, learn, learn all about your story. So great to see you, and thanks so much for being here today. Thank you for having me, Kevin. So I know that uh, fighting liver cancer and all forms of cancer is uh, particularly uh, poignant for you because you have a... a personal connection to the fight and I know that you start, started Blue Fairy mm -hmm. in, in response to trying to fight cancer. So can you tell me about that and uh, all the good work you do uh, throughout uh, the foundation? Sure. So I have lost six family members to five different kinds of cancer, uh, lung, liver, breast, bone, and head and neck. But the most significant loss was my sister, Adrian. When I was 22 years old, I was living in Los Angeles. I had graduated from college and I ended up getting custody of my then eight-year-old sister, Adrian. So I was her only parent and her legal guardian. I raised her all through my 20s until one month after her 15th birthday, she was very unexpectedly very suddenly diagnosed with stage four liver cancer. And um, that was a very short cancer journey, if you will. Um, she was only sick 147 days and, and she did um, die from the disease. And it was quite devastating for me. Um, I was 29 years old and um, had really devoted my life to raising her. And so I feel like I lost not only my sister, but also my child. And about a year and a half after she died, I was just really looking for a way to channel my grief. I just, I needed to do something with it. And my plan was to volunteer for the largest liver disease charity here in the U.S. And I tried, but they did not want to have anything to do with liver cancer at the time. And it really came down to no one else um, in the U.S., no other advocacy group was doing anything in primary liver cancer um, or hepatocellular carcinoma, as it's known. And so I ended up starting a nonprofit. Um, it's called Blue Fairy, the Adrian Wilson Liver Cancer Association. Um, you can learn more at bluefairy.org. And Blue Fairy's mission is to prevent, treat, and cure primary liver cancer, specifically hepatocellular carcinoma through research, education, and advocacy. And uh, uh, can you tell me uh, how the fight has uh, changed you as a person and sort of uh, making sure that your sister's uh, memory lives on through the fight and the work that you do? 
Sure. Well, when I was a little girl, I didn't say I want to run a charity when I grow up or, <laughs> um, or this is going to be my mission. Um, you know, it, it, it completely changed me. I turned 30 the year after my sister died and everything I had been doing no longer mattered anymore. When I was raising my sister, I was a teacher, but I was also pursuing a career in acting in Los Angeles. And um, none of that really brought me any more joy. Um, and I had even been doing some directing of theater in Los Angeles and actually getting paid a little bit for it um, and doing quite well. And, and to give you kind of the, the striking difference, um, the year before my sister was diagnosed, I had acted in three plays and I had directed three other plays. And so, wow. yeah. yeah, every month I was doing something in theater and my sister actually was an incredible artist. And so I was always uh, making her work for free and she was designing props for me and, and she was really involved too. And the next year I just, I, I just really didn't care um, anymore about it. I still stayed in the acting space a few more years, but um, I was sort of treading water and looking for a way to change direction um, be, because that, that life, the life didn't matter anymore. Um, I just, I needed to do something with a higher purpose. Um, and I really didn't want people to go through what my sister and I went through. Um, primary liver cancer is, it's just so devastating. Um, it's on the rise in almost every single country. And outside of the U.S. and Canada, it's one of the most common cancers worldwide. Um, and so I really wanted to bring attention to it. I really wanted to educate patients and caregivers um, and really advocate for them. And Deborah, what's the most powerful message or story that you've been impacted by uh, during your fight on this mission? Besides my own, right? <laughs> Besides your own, yes. Um, you know, I, I would say the most powerful story recently was a couple, an amazing couple in Northern California. And unlike most people, he was aware that he had a liver disease. He had hepatitis C. Um, he had a hepatologist, a hepatologist to study someone who specializes in liver disease. And unfortunately, that hepatologist did not monitor his liver. Um, and so if you do have an underlying liver disease, you do need to have ongoing scans of your liver. Um, and, you know, because he had a bad doctor, I mean, that's the bottom line, um, his liver wasn't monitored. And even though he was able to get rid of his hepatitis C through the curative drugs that are now on the market, he ended up developing liver cancer. And that never should have happened. And and to me, that's just heartbreaking. And this couple's story is so powerful because they really, you know, they really didn't feel sorry for themselves. Um, and they put up a good fight for three years. Um, he did pass away earlier this year, right before the pandemic, actually. And his goal was to make it to his 70th birthday. And he did. Um, and they're just, they're a lovely couple. I work with his wife now um, in a couple different capacities, um, but it broke my heart because he did know that he had an underlying liver condition and he just had a bad doctor and, 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 that, and that shouldn't happen. That's so unfortunate. Yeah. So I also know that you uh, are the co-founder of uh, Cancer U, yeah. uh, which is a digital health company. Uh, and it's a for-profit uh, social benefit. So can you tell me about that? Sure. So can Cancer U, you introduced it perfectly. It's a health tech startup. Um, cancer U is an online membership platform for cancer patients and caregivers, so all types of cancer, to educate, empower, and engage them to become advocates for their cancer care to improve outcomes and reduce cost. Um, I co-founded the organization two years ago, and it really came out of what I was seeing in my own nonprofit in that... Um, even when people are given the best possible information, 95% of the time, they don't know what to do with it next. And so I have been coaching patients and caregivers pro bono for years and really helping them take that information that they've been given and knowing what the next steps are. And I liken it to giving someone a fish and teaching them how to fish. And that extra component is so critical. Um, information, 
is an education is not any good if people don't know what to do with it. And so with Cancer U, the end users of our platform are patients and caregivers, but we never want to charge them. So our customers are hospitals, health insurance companies, private employer health plans, and pharmaceutical companies. Because um, as you know, here in the U.S., we don't have a national health care system, so it's a little bit different. It's a lot different than where I am on this side of the border, huh? I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure it is. <laughs> uh, Although I am a member of the um, Canadian Cancer Survivor Network, I think it is. Yes, I, I read that in your uh, bio. So, uh, yeah, you have an international appeal. So congratulations <laughs> on that. <laughs> So I also believe you spent over a decade as an educator. So I'm, I'm curious, particularly in this time of uh, COVID-19 to get your assessment on the current state and status of the American education system. Wow, what a tough time to be a teacher, right? Um, Isn't it? Yeah, I, I will say this. There are a couple things that have really come out of this pandemic, um, at least in the U.S. that I've seen that are, t that are good. Two things. One, telehealth has really been embraced by patients and also by providers. Um, now, there are signs now that people are using telehealth less and going back to their doctors as more states open up. But just in general, the fact that people realize that they can still see their doctor via a telephone call or a video conference call is, is huge. And, and that happened almost overnight. The other thing is I've seen a much, much deeper appreciation for teachers than when I was teaching. Um, I, I kind of laugh with, with my friends and, and my LinkedIn peers who are just so overwhelmed with the homeschooling they were having to do a few months ago. And they really had no comprehension of how difficult it was to be a teacher. And, um, and yeah, I feel for these teachers because, you know, online learning is not for everyone, um, and I certainly don't think it works for really young students. Uh, I, I think it's really hard. I mean, how do you keep a six-year-old engaged? Yeah, they don't have the best attention span, you're right. Yeah, um, and so, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm really concerned, actually. I'm less concerned about the teachers. I'm more concerned about what's going to happen to the students who missed months and months of school, um, who, uh, who aren't learning you know, as much as they could be or should be learning. And I've actually known a lot of families now who have decided to just kind of chalk this up, you know, as a, um, oh, what they call, what they call it, a, that year between high school and college. There's a phrase, there's a word for it I'm missing. But I know a lot of families now that have decided to take the time, get an RV and just travel around the U.S. and consider it that to be the learning experience for their kids until this pandemic really passes. Well, it's much more interactive than sitting in front of a computer, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Abs absolutely. So you piqued my interest on something. So I'll ask you this qu question. Are you worried about uh, veteran teachers who may be uh, shied away from coming back to work uh, because of the pandemic? And what would be your message to veteran teachers out there that are struggling on whether to go back to work or stay home because of the pandemic? Well, when I was teaching, I always had a cold when I was working with younger students because, um, because kids are really, especially, I, I mean, again, really young students, like under the age of 10, are really touchy-feely. Uh, I mean, I always, always was struggling with, with a cold, um, less so with, with older students, but um, I don't know. You signed up to be a teacher, and I, I think you should do your job. I do. Um, if you feel the need to wear a mask, just make sure the students actually understand what you're saying. Um, if, the, if that's what makes you feel more comfortable, um, but you know you have a job to do, um, and there are a lot of preventative measures you can take from, you know, continuously washing your hands to keeping the classroom clean, to even having the students, you know, kind of, you know, wash, wash their hands with a little sanitizer when they come in the door. I mean, there's, there are so many measures that you can put into place um, 
to keep it a cleaner you know, environment as much as possible. Uh, but I think it's really important that, that kids go back to school and teachers go back to work. Now, as a healthcare advocate, as you know, uh, the Supreme Court in the United States is going to take up the Affordable Care Act the, the week after the presidential election. Talk about timing, huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm cu curious to know, are you uh, worried about of the future of healthcare and the act in America? I am not worried because once a program is widely accepted by the public in the US, it is very hard to completely undo it. You can roll it back sometimes, but it's almost impossible. I don't think the Affordable Care Act is going away. Um, I think it's very important that people with pre-existing conditions are covered. Um, and whether you like the Affordable Care Act or, or not, Whatever your politics may be, I think everyone agrees that people with pre-existing conditions need to be covered. And of course, as a cancer patient advocate, I support that. And actually, I have my own pre-existing condition with a thyroid disease. So, um, and I've been denied insurance in the past many years ago because of it. So I don't think it's going to be rolled back completely. I think that's impossible to do at this point. Um, but there are, is a lot of room for improvement. Now, I, I don't have to tell you that uh, the fight to end cancer is a never-ending battle. So you've done so much in terms of advocacy and speaking out on the disease itself. So what do you think is your, your big, biggest uh, contribution uh, to advancing the cause forward? I don't know, Kevin. I don't think I've made it yet. I don't think I've made it yet. I think that has it's still yet to come. Um, I, I do know that I'm closely associated with primary liver cancer now, and I've been told that I've made a difference there, but for me, it's not quite enough. Um, I, I, I wanna see a cure, at least for liver cancer in my lifetime, um, but we, we have a long way to go, a really long way to go. And what advancements do you th think we've made uh, in the fight? I know you said we have a long way to go, but, but what has you uh, most optimistic about the fight? Well, when cancer was first discovered, it was treated like, and I'm really oversimplifying, but it was treated like one disease, like all cancers were the same. And then um, after, you know, more, you know, advances in science, there was an understanding that, wait a minute, not all cancers are the same. There are about 200 different kinds of cancer. And even within certain kinds of cancers, there's subtypes. Um, and now we've kind of come full circle in that, yes, cancers are different. However, it really comes down to your genes in terms of what type of treatment you will respond to. And so that's why you are now seeing drugs in the market that were originally intended for one cancer being approved for other types of cancer if people have a very specific gene or um, they, ha they have a certain what they call tumor marker in their blood. And so what we're seeing now is that we're seeing the very, very beginning of precision medicine. It's still very new. Um, it's in its infancy. It is very expensive, but we are starting to see where you don't just give standard of care to somebody and hope it works because it, if it's an advanced disease or a cancer that's not well known, it probably won't. Won't. We are seeing now, okay, you need to look at someone's genetic makeup and match what their genes are with the therapy. Uh, and so there is progress there. Um, and so that's very exciting to me. Um, and it seems like the science is, is getting better, faster. Uh, and uh, what, where would you like to see uh, more progress being made? Well, I would like to see more progress um, here in the U.S. across um, all socioeconomic um, levels, if you will. Um, here in the U.S., 
85% of people are seen in what's called a community cancer setting. So that's your, like your local doctor um, and your local oncologist. And only 3% of those people go on to a clinical trial. And so here in the U.S., we really lack diversity in clinical trials. Um, and and because, because of that, um, we lack information that we so desperately need. And um, I would really like to see that change. I believe it can change. Um, and that's a big part of what Cancer U is doing is from the very, very beginning, from our orientation course, we are talking about clinical trials and really helping people understand because I believe we can equalize cancer care, but we have to meet people where they are. And often when I, when I see a lot of information that's out there, it's, it's just not written at a level where people can understand it. I don't know what it is in Canada but the average reading level in the U.S. is seventh grade. So you have to meet people where they are. Absolutely. And let, let's talk about your memoir, uh, Better Off Bald, which I know that you also turned into a podcast. So can you tell me about that? Yeah, so Better Off Bald, A Life of 147 Days, is the story of raising my sister Adrian and losing her to liver cancer. So... I wrote the book like a journal because when Adrian was sick, I kept a medical diary um, every single day. And also she was a writer and she had started an online journal before she got sick and she continued with it um, after she was diagnosed. And so, for example, like chapter one is day one. And by day three, every single chapter is introduced with her point of view, her actual words from her journals. Um, and so you really get to see both the patient perspective of this cancer journey and then, of course, my perspective as the caregiver. Um, and, and it really does have a journal feel. There are photos um, in the book as well. And, and it moves very fast because, because it is only 147 days. Um, and I also use flashbacks to kind of tell that story of those seven years that I raised her you know, before cancer happened. Um, so, uh, so there's good stuff in there too. Um, there's humor. And as for the podcast, uh, three years ago, I did a podcast limited series, uh, 40 episodes. That was essentially an audio version of the book. Um, the book is slightly different. Um, now it's a little bit shorter, but, but I did an audio version and it really was a test to see if if anyone was interested in this story, because I have been told by so many literary agents that the story was amazing and beautiful and the writing was excellent, but it was too sad. And I think that is because here, especially in the U.S., we always want a happy Hollywood ending. We want that Disney film. And, uh, and too many people said to me, oh, it's just too sad. You know, your sister dies. It's too sad. And it turned out that podcast resonated with so many people and my nonprofit ended up getting volunteers from that podcast. Um, I still get emails from it um, and I still get downloads every day and I'm not promoting it. And so that really gave me the impetus and momentum to move forward with getting the book published. Well, congratulations on that, by the way. Thank you. Uh, and you and I both know the value of caregivers. As you know, I have uh, cerebral palsy and you're a healthcare advocate. And so my, qu my next question to you is, do you think the value of healthcare workers is being uh, adequately or appropriately noticed now in the pandemic? And what would you uh, message be to uh, the healthcare workers who are engaging in this fight every day? I, I think like teachers, healthcare workers, at least again, here in the U.S. are being acknowledged much more and really appreciated. I mean, we don't think about it very much, but healthcare workers are always on the front lines. You know, they're, they're, they're always out there. I mean, I know for me, if I want to get sick, all I have to do is go to a hospital. Even before the pandemic, I actually had a surgery last year. I was in the hospital for just somewhat outpatient surgery. I was in the hospital a day and a half 
and I left the hospital with the worst cold that you can possibly imagine. And it was because, again, I'm just in the hospital. There are all these people who are sick and germs. And, and so our healthcare workers are always on the front lines. But I think now with this pandemic, people really have a new appreciation for just how hard um, not only our doctors work, because I do think to some extent people revere doctors again in this country, but also just our nurses, our EMTs, the nurse practitioners. Uh, I really, um, I, I like I like seeing that um, because my mother was a nurse and I know how hard she worked. Absolutely. And my final question for you has to do with, you've done so much to uh, contribute to this, uh, the advancement of society when it comes to cancer and medicine. So I'm wondering what you hope to be remembered by when uh, people look back on your life. Um. Well, I, I do hope people remember my sister's story, and I think that's already happy, happening, so that makes me very happy. Um, but I hope that people remember that I was part of um, the creation of Cancer University. I, I want Cancer University to become a given that, unfortunately, when you have this cancer diagnosis, um, it's horrible and it sucks, but it's sort of a, it's a free pass. It's, it's, it's the, the, the cost of getting a, an admission, if you will, to Cancer University. And so, so a doctor will say, after telling you, you have cancer, he will say, but hey, you know what? A hospital has a partnership with Cancer University. Let's get you enrolled today. I want it to be just a given that this becomes part of your care as a cancer patient and as a caregiver, we do include caregivers as members because they are so critical to the role of a cancer patient and their journey and their health and their survival. So I really hope that um, that's, that's my legacy, um, that and seeing a cure for liver cancer. Fantastic. Andrea, I learned so much spending a few minutes with you. I really want to thank you for uh, sharing uh, your personal story and the fight that you've embarked on to uh, cure cancer. So thanks so much for being here and for sharing your story this afternoon. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Kevin.